You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. The job of the case manager is to keep the case moving and to help the litigants file their documents in the proper form so that they can get them to the judges without uh, a lot of uh, problems and that when they get to the judges, the judges can go to the meat of the motion without having to um, uh, worry about a lot of procedural mistakes. When the cases come to be calendared, that's when my role kicks in as far as getting the cases matched up with the panel and having to deal with various things like screening for recusing, making sure the cases are absolutely ripe to go before a panel of the court, and making sure that a after the case is actually calendared, that everything runs smoothly for the panel and for the attorneys. The motions practice keeps the cases flowing. Let's take, for example, extension motions. If you're, if you're granting way too many extensions, you're keeping a case from progressing. Um, motions for stay can be important because um, without a stay, something may be mooted. Um, so the motions practice is important in terms of whether the case remains alive and whether it keeps moving and progressing to its conclusion. Data quality is extremely important in, in every aspect of this job. Um, if your data is, is correct, then it makes everybody's job easier. What One of the primary goals is to make sure that we don't have duplications, we don't have errors, and that just assists everybody. If you, don't, if you have multiple duplications, it makes the job difficult, especially under the confines of the AIM system and the docketing system. So we have gone through a lot of pr procedures and a lot of processes to make sure our data is correct. Well, they say justice delayed you know, is justice denied. I mean, if our case managers are not monitoring the cases, they can be opened, and they can be opened perfectly, and we can have no duplicate addresses. And if they sit there, then it's not going to do anyone any good. We really, at this juncture of the case, we really have to move the cases along so that we will be able to present our judges with sufficient, you know, ripe cases to, to hear arguments on or to, to decide on uh, submitted uh, briefs. So uh, it's up to our case managers, really, to move these cases. Welcome to Appellate Case Processing, the second of three Federal Judicial Center FJTN broadcasts on the administration of appellate cases. Today we're going to look at some of the processes and the challenges that appellate court staff face during the period once a case has been open, but prior to closing. First, I'd like to introduce the members of our panel. Uh, in the studio with me are Kathy Brower, Chief Deputy Clerk for Operations for the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, and Scott Ritchie. Counsel to the Clerk of Court for the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Also joining us via Push to Talk are Susan Gelmas, Supervisory Motions Attorney for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and Amy Frazier, Data Quality Trainer for the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. Welcome, everyone. In addition to processes and challenges, we found out that the courts have come up with many effective practices to help them. Through discussions with panelists here in the studio, and at nine Push to Talk sites, we'll learn more about those practices and what court units are doing to successfully meet challenges. The court units participating will tell us what works for them. Now, these same practices may not be effective for you. That's for your judges and for your courts to decide. We have quite a bit to talk about in just an hour and a half. We have so many subjects and, and so little time. So as a result of this broadcast, uh, we hope that you'll be more familiar with issues and challenges facing court staff during the case processing phase, be able to identify some techniques and effective practices developed by other court units to meet those challenges, and to be familiar with some information sources that might provide assistance to you. We want to encourage you to participate, ask questions, share your thoughts with us, and you can do this either through push to talk or by sending us a fax. Our toll-free fax number will appear on the screen throughout this broadcast. And feel free to use the fax form that was located at, at JNET 
www.fjc.dcn at any time during the broadcast. Uh, if you haven't already downloaded it, you may want to pay special notices to the effective practices submitted by your colleagues and included as part of our participant guide. Now on to today's agenda. In the first panel, we're going to, sc to discuss primarily motion practices, as well as briefs processing, continued case screening and calendaring, and again, the emphasis is on the challenges faced by court staff and the process and practices utilized. Our second panel discussion will focus on the important issue of quality control. With all the information required during this period, what are the challenges and are there measures your circuit has taken to ensure accuracy? Finally, we'll cover the issue of communication. How do you keep attorneys and internal staff aware of changes in the FRAP rules, local rules and IOP, IOPs? How do you deal with pro se filers? And where do you go and what do you have to do to get additional or clarifying information? And then finally, we'll end this session with, uh, with a, a little wrap-up. Let's get started. In opening each discussion, we would like to set the stage, so to speak, with a short video clip. Here's the first one. When a case is doc initially docketed, um, a checklist which uh, states what is required in particular documents is sent out to the attorneys. On the checklist are the particular statements that would be required in a brief uh, and an appendix if they're submitting an appendix, documents supporting their briefs, uh, providing information to the court. Also, we do have a website which uh, has not only the checklist but also the rules and procedures of the court for the ease of the attorneys and those preparing documents. After the briefing notice is issued, it's almost certain that the case is going to be calendared before a panel of the court. So this is when you're going to match up the panels to the cases and in random nature and also that is when the attorneys are going to be notified in terms of whether their case is going to be you know, submitted on the briefs or orally argued. And that's a very important process not only for the court itself in disposing of cases but in notifying the attorneys because then they get the opportunity to present their case before the court. The case managers will issue the briefing schedule. Um, they will handle any extension requests, but when the briefs actually come in, the briefing specialist will make sure that they comply. And then um, the calendaring of the cases is done by the calendaring unit. But pretty much everything else the case managers handle with help here and there from other people. So. In order for us to manage our practice better, we need it to come up with procedures to handle the motions. Um, and the, the use of the paralegals has been very effective. Um, another thing that um, happened recently was that the court passed a local rule which allows for verbal extensions of time to be granted, um, which has been a big help. And the legal assistants field those phone calls, make the requisite docket entries, um, and it cuts down on some of the paperwork that we have to deal with. I think technology has been great so far. Um, our website has been a huge help uh, because the opinions are available on, our, on the website, the docket sheets, um, the forms that we require are all available on the website, so, uh, and the federal rules, the local rules, the internal operating procedures. We also have come up with procedures for our case managers um, to be on the lookout for certain types of motions that usually generate emergencies. So they know to look for anything that says bail or release. They know to look for anything that says stay of deportation or expedite. Um, there are certain buzzwords that we've put out to them. And they are told to bring those documents to one of the attorneys as soon as they see it. Um, because I think advance notice allows you to manage the emergency more effectively. As we saw in that opening clip, the challenges are numerous. There's a lot of information that's been received and, and having to be, has to be processed. During this period, staff attorneys, case managers, those in charge of calendaring, and other court staff play a crucial role in, in ensuring that cases are kept moving toward resolution, either on the briefs or during, uh, or during argument uh, before a panel. Uh, let's go around the, the table. Kathy Brower, let me turn to you first. Um, how does the Third Circuit uh, deal with motions, and also what's the role of staff? 
Uh, well, there are basically two categories of motions um, across, I think, across all circuits, and uh, those would be the procedural motions, which tend to be your run-of-the-mill extensions of time or motions to file oversized documents, briefs, etc. Um, and um, these are, in our circuit at least, mostly handled by the clerk. Um, and then there are the substantive motions, uh, which include your big ticket type motion. That's like your motions to dismiss or for summary affirmance or a motion for a certificate of appealability, those that might result in the uh, disposition of the entire case. Uh, and then, of course, motions for stay uh, of deportation, uh, motions for bail. Um, these are substantive motions which are often emergency motions, and, um, and those are the ones that Kelly alluded to in the earlier clip. Um, they are very hot potatoes, and they have to be dealt with very, very quickly. Um, our uh, case managers have um, a lot of responsibility in connection with processing motions. Um, they have to determine what kind of motion it is. Uh, if it's a procedural motion, they will basically route it to one of our legal assistants uh, who are responsible for disposing of these kinds of motions. Um, if it is a, a substantive motion that has to go to the court, uh, the case manager has to uh, first look at the case. If it has been calendared, it is already associated with the panel, the merits panel, and therefore they would know what panel to send the motion to. Um, if it is not uh, yet calendared, we have in the Third Circuit um, four standing motion panels um, of judges, and it is up to the case manager to look at our um, motion lists and select one of the uh, those panels after having done a recusal check to make sure that uh, none of the judges on any one of those panels might have to be, uh, you know, that we couldn't use the panel because of a recusal. Um, and then finally, uh, the, uh, the case manager has to determine whether it's a one, two, or three judge motion. Any dispositive motion would be uh, automatically a three judge motion. There are a variety of procedural motions, um, which, uh, if handled by the judges, are one judge or a single judge motions. And then um, those that fall in between the two can be decided uh, by a minimum of two uh, judges. Um, and then our clerks will, our, our case managers will prepare an order page based on that information, who the judges are, um, laying out the motions, putting in a response time if necessary, and so on. So, so they have quite a lot to do, even though they are not, in our circuit at least, responsible for disposing of any motions. They do have to do a lot of preliminary work in yeah. order to get them ready. Yeah. Um, I understand also that uh, your circuit has a procedures manual that it uses, and uh, I guess it's on your internal, um, uh, it's available to them electronically? Or? Well, we have a, a procedures manual which has evolved over time, and it, in, in manual form it's quite thick, uh, and it has, has grown over time. It is being constantly updated and worked on, and those portions which have been updated in the recent past are available on our network and people can access them uh, doing a search and so on. So um, it's, uh, of course, we do have a section on, ma on uh, motion procedures and so the uh, case managers don't have to memorize what is a one, two, or three judge motion. There are lists within the, ma the procedures manual which will guide them as to what kind of motion it is and whether it's a one, a two, or a three judge. A lot of responsibility on the part of, uh, of case managers for that initial review anyway to determine Absolutely. where it, uh, where it and goes. And also they not only have to identify motions but also response papers which mm -hmm. are sometimes a little bit more difficult to recognize. Right. Uh, Scott, let me turn the ball over to you. What about the Fourth Circuit? Is it similar to what uh, what's happening in the in the Third, or different? Well, Bob, as uh, as Kathy pointed out, most appellate courts divide up their motions between substantive and procedural. The uh, the important point is is where you create that dividing line. And in the Fourth Circuit, we divide them very strongly in favor of substantive, very small number of substantive motions, great number of procedural motions. Approximately ninety percent of the motions filed in the Fourth Circuit are acted on by staff and are not sent to the court. Uh, we have authority to act on motions which in many courts are considered uh, substantive in nature. Motions for leave to file brief as amicus curiae. Uh, motion to uh, supplement the record, or modify the record on appeal. A motion for leave to proceed in form of papyrus. And uh, motions to stay the mandate are all acted on by the clerk's office and not referred to the court for disposition. Uh, because of this, uh, there's a lot of involvement by our case managers in acting on some of these procedural motions and uh, they've received quite a bit of training and are trying to act in an appropriate manner in each of these cases. 
which brings up to the point about consistency. Because we have so many different people in our clerk's office acting on procedural motions, uh, we have to emphasize the consistency, which comes with training and with other materials which they have available to them so they can act in a consistent manner. Our court, having delegated so much authority to the clerk to act on motions, expects that these motions will be acted on in a very rapid fashion. Because of that, we have established a one-day turnaround time on motions. To accomplish this, we have adopted a local rule which requires whenever counsel files a motion, the counsel indicate in the motion whether or not the other side intends to oppose the motion. They are required to contact the other side and find out whether the other side consents or will not oppose or intends to file a response in opposition. Therefore, we know once a motion arrives in our office whether we can act on it immediately or whether we have to uh, obtain a response before uh, it's referred for consideration. The, uh, the uh, substantive motions are, of course, referred to the court. We do not use two judge panels. We use one and three judge panels. Uh, we send uh, motions the whole case in abeyance to a single circuit judge. Any request for reconsideration taken by the clerk is sent to a single circuit judge in the first instance. We reserve the, uh, the privilege or right to reconsider any action taken by the clerk's office before we refer the matter to a single circuit judge. We've decided we've taken the wrong action in the first instance or the matter is such that it's a matter of question granting a couple more days for a brief or an item such as that that's not really worth putting out before the court, we can grant a motion to reconsider in the clerk's office and grant the party additional relief. Perhaps not all the relief that they're seeking, but at least some additional relief. Substantive motions which go to the court in the first instance are motions for bail pending appeal, motions for stay. Other dispositive motions, which are ultimately referred to a three-judge panel, go through our office staff counsel where they make a recommendation as to the proper disposition. Now, your procedural uh, motions as well are subject to review. Absolutely. To uh, we have a local rule that uh, any party can ask for reconsideration within 14 days. We uh, are very much supported by our judges. Rarely uh, are motions to reconsider granted. If they are, we learn from this, and uh, we evolve and improve our practices. We take into account any time our judges feel that our practices are not in complete compliance with their intentions. Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking a little bit about some of the challenges uh, to uh, that court staff face, and you mentioned consistency, and that uh, we'll we'll talk about that uh, not only next, but when we talk about communication. Um, uh, Amy Frazier, let me turn it uh, over to you in, in the Tenth Circuit. Talk to us a little bit about uh, about the process uh, there. Here at the Tenth Circuit, our case managers initially receive all of the motions. Um, they also determine where to route the motion to, so they have quite a bit of responsibility. Um, they do have a routing procedures tool they can use and follow if they're not sure where a motion should go. Um, as I said, they do have a lot of discretion and they can rule on quite a few motions. We have a motions team as well that will help them out if they're not sure on what to do with the motion. Um, our emergency motions go to staff council and uh, motions which need immediate ruling that need a judge's ruling will go to what's called a clerk's panel. And our clerk's panel is made up of two judges. Other motions that do not need immediate ruling but need a judge's ruling, they'll uh, we'll wait for the case to be fully briefed and will be submitted when the panel is assigned to the particular case. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, for those courts that are pushed to talk, um, just a word of, of caution. Uh, when you do want to uh, send us uh, or, or speak to us, uh, it's always good to mute your, uh, your uh, television because uh, otherwise you'll, you'll get feedback. Uh, let me turn it over uh, to Susan Gelmas in the Ninth Circuit. Susan, describe the motions practices there and how that operates. Well, let me start by just saying that because we're such a large circuit that's spread out all over uh, the nine western states, all of our motions practice is actually centralized in San Francisco uh, from the original receipt of the motions by the docketing clerks um, and uh, to, through disposition of the motions, uh, depending on how, what kind of a motion it is. So we have a very centralized um, geographical location, but we have a number of different units within the court that work on motions, and the docketing 
uh, staff has to, when they docket the motions, they have to figure out where it belongs. Procedural motions generally um, are sent to the clerk's office procedural motions unit, which is a staff of six paralegals um, who are uh, the motions that go to them are very specifically delineated in the court's general orders so that it's clear to everybody what kinds of motions they have authority to act on. And they can act on those in clerk orders, or they can present them to our appellate commissioner, who is sort of the equivalent of a magistrate judge at the circuit level. We have one appellate commissioner. Um, Substantive motions, or basically any motion that isn't listed in the general orders as a procedural motion, are referred to the motions and or pro se units. Um, the pro se unit is sort of a subset of the motions unit. And there are paralegals and attorneys in that unit who will um, act on these motions. Again, some motions are delineated as being able to be decided by a clerk order. Some are um, what used to go to one judge in our circuit now goes to the appellate commissioner, and so the paralegals or attorneys will present those motions to the appellate commissioner. And then the remaining motions that need to be presented to judges are presented by the staff attorneys to the, um, a panel of three, two or three judges, um, depending on the type of motion it is. A different set of judges is responsible every month for being for hearing motions and they come to san francisco either in person or by video for a week of each month and part of what they're doing there is to hear substantive motions and decide them emergencies they hear over the phone but everything is presented to them orally by staff attorneys um, who do the initial intake on emergencies Our, we have a local rule that requires parties filing an emergency motion to contact the staff attorney directly and to arrange for the filing which can be by fax if authorized um, so that we can get those motions going as quickly as possible. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, as you can see, it's defined uh, differently by, uh, by different circuits, but it seems to me the common denominator is there's a tremendous amount of responsibility that, uh, that staff has in order to, to carry out uh, 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 these functions. Uh, let me ask uh, each of our panel members, you've defined the process and uh, including the role of, of staff and uh, while it's different among, uh, among uh, circuits, I'd have you also define some of the challenges now that you think are kind of key. What does court staff, some of these challenges that they face, and what do you think are the key to, su the key to success? Scott, let me start with you. Well, I believe the, the key to success is keeping abreast of the current practices and procedures of the uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, it's a very complex practice, and we require our case managers and other members of the clerk's office to know a tremendous amount of practice and procedure and being able to advise the practicing bar and pro se's as to what the current practice is. Not a day goes by when we don't have a new procedure or practice that we have to identify and modify. It's amazing how much complexity there is in appellate practice. And the practicing bar depends on us for this because the average attorney does not come before the Court of Appeals on a regular basis. And so they turn very heavily to the staff of the Court of Appeals to be able to tell them what the appropriate practice is and how to best go about uh, uh, following the case and pursuing their uh, issues before the court. Yeah. That too, though, a fine line between um, um, what, the, uh, what the proper way to do something in and actually giving legal advice. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. um, but again, it's the issue of staying ahead of, uh, of, of the change and, and being able to communicate that to some of your customers. So communication is a really That's important. That's right. And that the uh, information being given by different individuals within the office is the same information. Right. Absolute consistency. Kathy. Uh, well, I agree with, uh, certainly with Scott. Um, and I think, uh, I think that the, the biggest challenge is, is uh, for our case managers, not only in motion practice, but all along uh, the uh, case processing, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, the, uh, <laughs> the whole process is that uh, you have this fine, uh, this balancing act sort of between uh, moving things expeditiously and yet taking time and being very very careful and making sure that you're not submitting something to the court that it has typos or is incorrect in some way or is missing some um, important information so so in, on one hand we're telling people you know go through your documents be expeditious make sure you get that those motions and responses to the attorneys uh, as soon as you get them uh, on the other hand we're, t we're saying take take care you know don't uh, don't rush to the extent that you're going to be uh, forwarding something to the court that you don't want them to have to look at. So, so I think that uh, 
in addition to taking into consideration all the variables that they have to take into consideration in order to know what, how to process this correctly, they then have to uh, be expeditious and also be very careful. Yeah, and we're going to be talking about data quality, but in this case, it's identifying uh, priorities, so setting priorities, being able to uh, right. identify what are key uh, key documents that has to have to be moved, uh, like emergency motions or whatever, they have to be moved expeditiously. Always, and I think Lynn mentioned that, and it's so true. It's constant, uh, you know, reshuffling of your priorities as things come in. What yeah. do I do first? What right. is we're the We're going to be important? talking about that. We have a, a few effective practices that we're going to be cite in terms uh, of the ability to flag those kinds of, uh, of priorities and, and move them forward, but again, very carefully. Uh, uh, Amy, the Tenth Circuit, talk a little bit about what you feel are, are some of those key challenges that court staff face. Hi, I think in our in our court, one of the main challenges is consistency and um, consistency individually and amongst the teams. And we try to overcome that through communication, uh, communicating with the clerk. He has an open door policy. And so basically starting there and, you know, working it out between the teams and, you know, within, it, within ever, everybody within the office. Thanks. Susan, Ninth Circuit, what do you think are some of the key challenges? Well, I would add, because I, I agree with all three of them, uh, in ter of the speakers in terms of what some of those problems are, I think we face those same challenges. I would add to that just generally trying to keep track of the the numerous papers the the voluminous amount of paper that we get hopefully when we end up in an electronic docketing system someday um, that some of that will uh, be less of a burden but that's you know papers get lost papers you know don't end up together they don't make sense and so keeping track of that and keeping the cases moving is a a big challenge for us and the other um, major challenge that we faced very recently was the huge increase in INS cases that um, all of a sudden came to us as a result of the uh, government basically requiring the Board of Immigration Appeals to get rid of their backlog. And so we jumped from maybe opening 100 cases a month to 150 cases a week, all of, you know, many of which uh, included stay of deportation or removal motions. And so we had an enormous uh, challenge in trying to just deal with the the emergency nature of uh, and the, the volume of these cases. Thanks so much. Um, we talked uh, before about uh, the ability to flag these, uh, these motions, some that might require an immediate attention or help folks identify um, uh, what were key documents within. Uh, and we want to cite a few effective practices. Uh, we have Oliva George from the Second Circuit on the line. Welcome, Oliva. And I understand that the Second Circuit has developed a practice that uh, expedites the review and processing of a motion and also flags priority documents. Could you describe them, please? Bob, um, actually, I'd like to start off by saying that I'd like to make a correction to our written submission um, in regards to the motion information statement. I think we indicated that it was a form, but it's titled a And it came about due to the motion information form Acts that Rule 27 out its usage. So a local rule was created that would permit the filing of this in this court. And in fact, the likeness of the motion information form, um, we can readily discern the short title, the docket number, synopsis of the relief that's requested, filers, and also an area, of course, where the uh, person acting or disposing of the motion act endorse the disposition. Thank you, Oliva. Thanks so much. You know, sometimes the most uh, effective practice doesn't always involve high-tech uh, uh, high uh, uh, changes. Rather, it's a very practical way of, uh, of alerting case managers and, uh, and others. And I think the example that Oliva has cited, which you can also find in your downloadable materials and the participant guide um, uh, for a, uh, a, a full description, um, just, just that. Uh, that. Um, uh, Kathy, I think you have an example in your circuit, uh, uh, too, a few examples of some small changes that made such a big difference. Yes, uh, it's funny, sometimes you don't need to expend a lot of resources or have uh, lots of time and money to, to make some, some changes that do help. Uh, 
We had a couple of minor uh, examples. Um, they probably wouldn't be applicable across circuit lines, but the concept, you know, is certainly transferable. Uh, we we have a deadline report that our case managers are responsible for, um, which will alert them of any delinquent documents in any of their cases. Uh, and in order to respond, they need to know whether whether the document's been received. Most of those documents would be in their in their um, work box. Uh, except briefs, because that's one uh, the one item that our case managers do not file uh, in the course of the case that's kind of taken out with the calendaring procedures mm -hmm. uh, and done by the briefing specialists. Uh, for that reason, when the briefs come in, they were on the other side of the office with the briefing specialists. They were logged in by our records and mail folks uh, who were taking the time and trouble to enter them into a, a a word perfect uh, document which was available on the network uh, each day had a separate document but in order to check to see whether or not uh, this brief may have been received and would be on that log was very cumbersome to go into it and go into each day's separate uh, document to check so uh, most of the case managers would have to stop what they were doing get up go over across the office look at the uh, printout of that uh, log for the last seven days and run through and see if their docket number was in the list. It was very cumbersome and it was really not efficient. And sometimes our case managers would put it aside and then their deadline report would not would be uh, delinquent itself. So uh, we got together, uh, Bill uh, Bradley supervises both the records and mail people and also the briefing specialists and uh, Trish Coleman, now Trish Dodds-White I should say now, uh, we all got together and talked about it we decided after talking that um, that the we could instead ask the records and mail clerks to create a docket entry just saying brief logs and in fact do away with the work that they were doing creating this other log. We didn't really need it once we had the information in the case. That of course would allow the case manager at his or her desk to simply pull up the case and see whether or not the brief was here and then they could act on their deadline report immediately. Um, it, it turned out, actually, that the um, records and mail folks had, act, had probably fewer keystrokes uh, involved in this. So it didn't create any extra work for them, but it really did save a lot of, uh, of work. It's a small thing. The, the, um, another example is a, uh, we have these motion panels and pro se panels set up to deal with the motions. And uh, the legal uh, division of the clerk's office, formerly the staff attorney's office, is now handling all of those things. Uh, they would uh, create um, lists of motions, long lists of motions, which would be sent each week to different panels, the A, Pro Se Panel, B, and so on. Uh, and uh, that information was emailed. Those lists were attached to an email that was sent out to all of the case managers. The case manager, in turn, was responsible for making a docket entry indicating that that motion or motions had been submitted to the court and which panel and so on. Um, the, the problem was the lists, even though they were um, they had clear, clearly indicated docket numbers and names, didn't have the case manager, and so e someone would have to look up every single one of these to see which case manager should get them and make sure that information is communicated to the case manager and so on. So uh, we simply asked the legal division if they would mind adding the initials of the case manager to these lists. It was a little extra work on their part, but not a lot, because they usually did call up the case and had that information in the heading of the uh, docket report right there. So uh, they agreed, and uh, now you simply open up one of these lists, run down, see if your initials are on any of, uh, next to any of the motions, and then simply print out that page, if, you, if it is, and make your docket entry. Again, we, we uh, you know, avoided a lot of du duplicate work uh, and unnecessary work. So they're very, very small things, but they did save time. And uh, as I said, the moral of the story or stories um, is that um, you know if you see something in in your uh, office maybe that isn't working so well or that prop that maybe looks like um, too many uh, hands are in the pot, stop and think about it, bring it up, uh, and maybe a solution can be found that would. Uh, result in um, you know in, in more efficient practice and uh, less work on on your your part or everybody's part. Right. Again, communication uh, issues, sharing that information with the folks that you work with, and taking the time just to think about the process that you use because in fact you could save a lot of, of time and and effort, better service. Uh, right. In fact, over overall.
Um, part of our discussion here is going to focus on case screening, and we know that a case is screened for uh, various purposes. In fact, in our very first broadcast when we dealt with a case opening, we used a wider definition of screening, and we noted that screening is a process by which a court determines what treatment an appeal will receive and what path it follows. And we touched on, we screened for jurisdictional defects, uh, suitability for court settlement or mediation programs, whether counsel should be appointed for an unrepresented party, whether litigants have complied with court-mandated requirements. These are all things we talked about. But um, like motion practices, case screening is defined differently in, in, in different uh, circuits. So let's go around the table uh, uh, again and describe why it occurs, how it occurs uh, uh, during, during this phase. Kathy? Uh, well, we have a great um, uh, recusal program that we use in the Third Circuit. It's a, a Fox Pro program that extracts uh, information from new aims and uh, such as party and attorney information for a particular case. And we'll compare it to, uh, to data that's stored regarding um, judges uh, recusals and that information is submitted by the judges and is uh, is entered into this program uh, the case manager bef we during the the process of the the, the appeal uh, when we issue a briefing schedule um, if any motion of course is filed it has to be sent to the court and uh, at a later juncture um, to if a uh, an en banc uh, petition for a hearing comes in of course, we have to do a recusal check because we constantly update that information in case, you know, uh, as Marcy says, stocks are bought and sold and so on, and uh, um, the judge's uh, recusal situation may change. So we're constantly uh, pre-screening the cases. Um, of course, the most important part uh, of getting the uh, recusals right is when we calendar the cases. Mm -hmm. And Bill Bradley is in charge of our, um, our calendaring unit. Uh, and he is the best person to sort of uh, talk about what kind of screening the, we do in the Third Circuit. So I'd like to turn it over to Bill. Are you there, Bill? Yes, I am. And what we do in the Third Circuit is, as Kathy mentioned, we utilize the recusal program and check the cases along the process. But specifically when the case is ready to be calendared before the court, our calendar supervisor, Ruthie Ramos, goes into each case and puts the docket number into the recusal program and it pulls up the parties, the law firms, and the attorneys in the case and it matches them against the judge's standing recusal list that's also entered into the database. Then what happens is the parties appear on screen as matches in terms of whether they're recused or not and then she can review that information. If that information is valid, what she does is she removes that particular case from her list and does not send it to that particular panel because one of the judges is recused. But what she also does in reference to that, after she does that final recusal check in the clerk's office before a case is calendared, what she does is she prepares a full report for the court, transmits it electronically, and the electronic report pulls and it or extracts from Ames the parties, the attorneys, and the law firms. And then the judges do the final recusal check on their part because they want to make sure that they are not recused in a case for a personal matter where we've already checked it for financial disclosure. And so the, the final check really lies with the court. And once they clear the case after reviewing that report, Ruthie Ramos, the calendar supervisor, then sends the cases to the court and they're fully cleared and there are no disqualification problems. Thanks so much, Bill. Now, uh, Scott, I know it's very different in the, in the Fourth Circuit. Yes, it is, Bob. Um, we use the term screening to refer to, uh, actually we call it screening and squibbing, refer to an initial review of appellant's brief. At the time appellant's brief is filed, a copy of the brief is referred to me, I review the brief to make a determination of whether or not the case merits oral argument. Of course, 50 percent of our docket is pro se, and those cases are automatically screened from the oral argument calendar and sent directly to the Office of Staff Counsel. The other 50 percent of our docket, which involve counsel cases, I review appellant's brief when it's filed to make a quick determination of whether or not the case clearly merits oral argument. I use the standards set forth in the Federal Rules of, of Appellant Procedure, and uh, at this point, I I'm making a determination about 70% of our 
cases, which are counsel cases, do not merit oral argument and are referred to the office staff counsel um, for their review in the first instance. The other 30%, I prepare what's referred to as a squib, which is a short description of the case, what it appears to me to be an issue or issues in the case, and that's available to uh, our judges so they can sort down their cases by difference between the Social Security case and antitrust case. And also, to uh, it's available on the um, Internet uh, to the practicing bar. Of course, we have a disclosure on there that indicates that this has been prepared by staff. And it's not really uh, reflects what the court may view as the central issue in the case. Those cases which are referred to the office staff counsel, a staff attorney is allowed to review all the briefs that are filed in the case and the joint appendix and then makes a determination of whether the case uh, deserves oral argument. Those cases in which they disagree with my initial determination, they'll return to the clerk's office for calendaring. The rest of the cases, they'll prepare a memorandum and place it out before a three-judge panel with a proposed disposition. At that point in time, any one of the three panel members, any one of the three judges on that panel considering the merits of the case, can decide that the case merits oral argument and refer it back to the clerk for filing and placement on the uh, calendar for oral argument. The uh, system works very well. The vast majority of cases that are on the calendar are on there because I placed them on them initially. The second number of cases come from the staff attorneys who return them after initial review. The smallest number of cases on our calendar are those which have gone through the entire process and a judge or judges have asked that the case be returned for oral argument. Turning to the, uh, uh, the recusal issue, we do not uh, review cases in advance for disqualifications. We do, of course, have standing disqualifications, but they're very limited in number. Normally, uh, a determination as disqualification does not occur until we have selected a member of the court for a, for a motion or the case is tentatively calendared, where we circulate all disqualifications and all calendared cases for that term to the, uh, to the panels, and they will return those cases in which they are disqualified. So actually, our active disqualification process occurs fairly late in the case processing system. Does this present with, uh, you with some challenges in terms of, uh, because this is done later in the, uh, in the process in terms of determining panels? Sometimes, in regard to emergency motion, we have a problem because when we uh, send it out initially to a panel, we'll quickly find out one of the judges is disqualified and scramble to uh, replace that judge. Mm -hmm. And of course, it does create a problem for the calendar clerk, too, at the calendaring process as he gets in the uh, disqualification of being able to set up panels that are not disqualified and can hear an appeal. Sometimes the case will have to be continued because you can't put three judges together that are all disqualified, or all not disqualified, mm -hmm. and can hear a case. And so it can create logistical problems. Right, as you say, especially for the calendar, uh, Indeed. Uh, calendar class. Um, uh, uh, Amy, let's look at the Tenth Circuit. Uh, talk to us a little bit about case screening and, and how it's done there. Uh, here at the Tenth Circuit, uh, case screening happens in many different phases. Um, all of our cases are screened initially for jurisdictional defects by um, our jurisdictional attorneys. And um, just that all happens before briefing. Those that make it through briefing uh, will be ready for submission. And uh, also at uh, case opening, we can add a flag that will, will tell us that a certain judge may be recused from the case. Um, if initially a judge is recused, or I'm sorry, if initially a judge is not recused, that should be, the judge will catch that later on. And usually that's done after briefing. Um, also, during case opening, um, we'll get a flag, New Ames, will, it will prompt a, 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 it's kind of a reminder that, that the litigant filing might be a, a three-striker, and those cases will be screened and usually don't make it to briefing. Susan, in the Ninth Circuit, just like everybody else's? A little bit of uh, several different. I, I think we have some something similar to what Scott was talking about, and uh, we do the jurisdictional screening up front that Amy was just referring to, um, as well as screening for settlement potential up front. But once we get um, once we've weeded out all the jurisdictionally defective or frivolous uh, appeals, and the, the cases actually go through briefing. Once it's fully briefed, it goes to our case management unit within the staff attorney's office. These are actually staff attorneys who will review the briefs 
and the excerpts, and um, we'll write, they'll do what we call inventory. They'll write up a, a blurb about what the case is about. They'll assign it a weight. And pro se cases are presumptively assigned as what we call screening cases, to further complicate the use of the term. And um, counsel's cases are assigned a weight that could be anything from a screening case or a three or a five or a seven or a ten. And the reason for the weights is that the cases that are going to go to, what, to argument panels are um, going to be distributed to any given panel according to a total weight. So you don't want to give one argument panel, you know, five of the most complicated cases, all what we would call ten weight cases with huge records, and give another argument panel five fairly straightforward three weight Social Security cases. So that's why we, the the for countering purposes, the weight is important. The cases that are assigned as screening cases are then referred back to the staff attorney's office, and those cases are presented again to those same motions panels that come once a month to San Francisco. They also hear the screening cases that are presented orally to them with a prepared disposition um, that is recommended. So we used to do them by way of memorandum the way the Fourth Circuit does. We now do those orally because there are so many of them. Um, and that the recusal issue uh, at the motions and oral screening stage, the staff attorney who's presenting the case is the one before they present it to make sure that none of the judges are recused. If the judges are recused, they'll either hold it and present it to next month's panel, or they'll call in a third judge from, uh, you know, off of the panel to, to help decide the case. At the calendaring stage where you have argument cases, the calendar unit will actually determine the recusals before placing any given case on an argument calendar. Thanks, Susan. Um, as you see, again, differences among the, uh, of, of the circuits. We have a number of push-to-talk courts out there, and I'd like to take this opportunity in the program to uh, allow them and encourage them, in fact, to uh, give us your thoughts in terms of the process you use. And also, uh, for those courts that want to uh, uh, submit a fax to us, I think that number will be on the screen, and we encourage you to do so. So let's just take uh, a few seconds and uh, see if there's anyone out there in the uh, a push to talk that would like to make a statement. Okay. Um, at this point, I'd like to make you aware of some publications from the Federal Judicial Center that uh, we refer to, and uh, they're also available in your bibliography that was part of the participants' uh, guide, the downloadable materials. And these are uh, case management procedures in the Federal Courts of Appeals. I was published in the year 2000, and it provides a careful description and comparison of case management uh, variations among the appellate courts all the way from case opening through case closing, and includes pro se, PLRA, habeas cases, and so forth. Uh, uh, a publication dealing with recusals, uh, that is an analysis of case law under 28 U.S.C. sections 455 and 144, and that was published in the year 2002 and a publication on mediation and conference programs in the Federal Courts of Appeals, a source book for judges and lawyers, published in 1997. And if you'd like a copy of any of these publications, you can make a request directly uh, from the FJC website at jnet.fjc.dcn. Uh, if there are no faxes and uh, no, uh, no folks from uh, Push to Talk Courts, uh, We'd like uh, then to, to move on to our next uh, session. Are there any, anyone in Push to Talk that would uh, like to make a comment? Let's move on to our next session then on quality control and communications. I think attention to detail is probably the most important um, skill. Um, and obviously, you know, learning, uh, being able to learn things quickly and to learn a large body of knowledge because Every case seems to have, you know, its little quirks, and what you did in one case before may not be the same um, as this in a civil case is different than a criminal case and different than an agency case. Um, I think good uh, proofreading skills are um, very important um, because Ames um, does not have spell check, and um, it's very important to to read over the order before you hit um, accept. One of the difficulties or the challenges that the present docketing system um, presents is that um, events, people, parties, places have to be put in a specific way. 
Um, we've devised um, standard um, abbreviations, which the case managers need to follow, which anybody needs to follow if you're going to look up a case, a person, an address on the system. You have to know what the abbreviation is, because if you didn't use the right abbreviation and you're searching, you're not going to get a hit. The other thing is to ensure that the data quality, or the data that has been put in is correct and that we don't have any duplications or any errors. We check every person that's been entered the following day. We check every party, every attorney to make sure that there, isn't any, there aren't any duplications. You have to have the ability to prioritize. You need to be able to look at what's on your desk and know that this has to be done now, that this can be done later. Um, you need to be able to skim through things and just catch certain words that you know these are important, you know, emergencies deportations. The key skill to dealing with pro se litigants is you have to have a lot of patience and um, you have to have good listening skills. Sometimes it's good to just listen and even if after listening to the whole conversation you knew from the first minute that uh, you were going to transfer to someone who can help them because throughout the whole conversation what they were asking you was legal wise, it's good to just listen. They like to get their point across and then you can just transfer them to the person that it is that can help them. It is critical throughout the appellate case processing that from the time the case is open until the time the case is closed, that the staff persons responsible for all the different facets of case processing communicate with each other because one aspect of the case eventually affects another aspect of the case. And in order for a case to move forward, everyone needs to be advised as to how the case is processing throughout the entire system. Case managers are, uh, they do have to be good communicators. They often have to, I think we have 45% of our caseload is pro se or prisoner, and so they often have to deal with people who are very closely involved with the case and not objective, as a pro se litigant will be. Um, they, they have to deal with staff. They have to deal with, uh, with attorney's offices, um, U.S. attorney's offices, federal defenders sometimes probation departments and so on, district courts. Um, so they really, they really do need to um, liaison among many different offices and uh, get things done. Attention to detail, the ability to prioritize. And in this segment, we're going to be talking about quality control. And there's a wonderful short article by Natalie Gable entitled, Is 99.9% .9 Good Enough? And in it, she talks about the negative impact of willingly accepting less than the best in quality. And she notes that in the language of the Malcolm Baldridge uh, National Quality Award, quality is a race with no finish line. And I think that's especially true of the service that uh, we provide uh, in the courts. Uh, in this segment, we're going to be talking about what we do in order to ensure that the information we receive and the process is, is free of mistakes. Uh, how do we check ourselves? Uh, you've already met our panel members, uh, Kathy Brower, Scott Ritchie, and Amy Frazier. We're going to be turning also to a number of push-to-talk uh, sites as they talk about uh, ensuring quality control. Uh, Kathy, again, I'm turning to you first. Like communication, which is going to be our, our next discussion, the quality control seems to be one of those overriding challenges that uh, greatly impacts everything else. Uh, what are the implications for appellate case pro processing, given all the information uh, that's required uh, at this point in the process? And where might such uh, data quality snafus perhaps uh, uh, occur? And how does your court uh, handle that? Well, uh, in the Third Circuit, we have a, a quality assurance team, which consists of four highly qualified uh, former supervisors in the clerk's office. Uh, they. Uh, spend time, as, as Trish mentioned in the, um, in the little uh, clip, um, they, they look at every case that was opened the day before. They make sure that all the parties that have been entered and all of the attorneys that have been entered are not duplicate uh, parties, that they've been entered correctly and the correct uh, abbreviations have been used. Um, they, uh, they look at every docket entry that's been made. And not only do they check the docket entries for typos and uh, grammatical mistakes, uh, but they also look at the process and to, ma to make sure that um, 
that no do particular docket entries were left out. For example, in a, in a they, they look at cases that were closed the day before as well. And in a case closing situation, they want to make sure that that JS-34 entry was made. Um, if a uh, procuring opinion was filed, they want to make sure that the case manager remembered to put in a, a private note that we have um, saying uh, procuring author, um, which identifies the author for internal staff, which is helpful for um, a variety of reasons. Um, the, um, they check for all of those things, and then they communicate to the case manager by way of email. Uh, they email to the case manager, whoever it was that made this error, uh, if it's a, especially if it's a new um, case manager or case manager trainee, they'll use that opportunity as sort of a, a teaching opportunity. Uh, and uh, we'll go into some detail as to why we didn't use this particular event this time. You were supposed to use something a little bit different because. In this case, you know, there was some set of circumstances that would require that. Uh, so they can be very educational um, as well. Uh, they send them out. They copy the uh, managers who are um, going to be reviewing these folks. And our clerk actually is copied on all of these, too. She takes a very um, direct interest in, uh, in how the case managers are doing. Um, and so, um, so it's kind of it's a serious thing. But uh, and then the case manager uh, who's receiving these uh, these notes uh, will have uh, up to three days to respond, unless they're on vacation, uh, so that you know they will correct the error and get back to the uh, QA team and say this was taken care of. Um, it's a good double checking mechanism. Um, on the we also of course have the the uh, section that Trish mentioned about. Um, case uh, or party uh, and address uh, information abbreviations. Uh, that is one of the sections of the manual that we talked about earlier that is um, on our network and can be accessed electronically. So if you want to do a search on a particular word, you're not sure how we put um, insurance in or whatever, uh, you can look it up and uh, make sure that you're using the correct abbreviation, uh, which won't result in a duplicate uh, party entry. So, uh, so that's how we handle it. We have a separate uh, team in the Third Circuit. That mm -hmm. um, it, it's not just reviewing, it's also communicating because you have to commu be able to, to communicate that information back to the case manager, back to the individual that's responsible. Very much so, yeah, yes. Yeah, that's really important. Uh, um, Scott, uh, when we were talking about motion practices, we talked about the challenges of consistency. So I'm sure that that's one uh, one of the challenges in terms of data, but what else, in addition to that, what else? Well, obviously, the, the, our quality control is focused on consistency. We're very much concerned with uh, making sure that a number of different individuals who have responsibilities act in a similar manner. We do not have a, a separate team for quality control. No one is specifically assigned the responsibility for quality control, but uh, our case management teams uh, rely heavily upon backup by the case management supervisor and their assistants. They actually take over periodically a review of a case, the handling of a case, and they have an opportunity to look at docket entries and at the filings in that case. And that performs a lot of our uh, quality control right there through backup. In addition to that, we uh, generate periodic status reports to make sure that a case is in the proper status. And those are reviewed by the case management supervisors and by the clerk personally to make sure that a case is, in fact, moving through the appellate system properly and is in the proper status. Uh, finally, a uh, quality control mechanism that I'm involved in is procedural histories. Our judges have asked that the, each case that is placed on the calendar, uh, if there's been any significant action taken during the appellate process, that we bring it to that panel's attention. Appellate judges know everything there is to know about a case, hopefully, from uh, the briefs and the joint appendix. They know exactly what occurred in the case below. Those documents do not reflect what's happened during the pendency of the case before the Court of Appeals. Many times significant actions have taken place in a case such as granting of a bail motion or other matters of supplementing the record, which the judges will, of course, need to know about when they hear argument on the merits of the case. Therefore, I receive uh, the, the case file and, a, and docket entries for each case that is calendared where any action has taken place by a previous judge, the motions, uh, motions panel, or by the clerk, which may impact upon the argument of the case. And at that time, I have an opportunity to review the uh, docket entries and the case file to determine whether or not uh, anything needs to bring, be brought to the court's attention. And it's a good final check before a case makes a calendar that everything is in a proper status and proper entries have been made. Uh, 
the uh, whole review process works very well in regard to catching uh, inconsistencies and possible errors. Mm -hmm. It allows us to rethink uh, procedures that we've placed into effect. And uh, having one last look at it before it makes the calendar makes sure that many of these uh, regrettable errors are caught before they actually go on and are seen by the court. Right, now you also issue status reports then. That's right. Correct? That's yeah. right. So indicate more alert. where a case stands in the appellate process right. as opposed to specific docket entries right. to make sure it's moving from one status to the next. And uh, if a case seems to be wallowing in a particular status, we'll wonder why it's pre-briefing for so long. And unless it's being placed in a band, so there's a record problem, uh, we'll question the why, why has the briefing schedule not been established for yeah. this case. Right. Thanks, Scott. Um, uh, Amy, the uh, Tenth Circuit was uh, the subject of, uh, of a program on court to court, and uh, which we talked about quality improvement uh, and, uh, and the team approach that's taken to, uh, uh, in the Tenth Circuit. So talk to me, uh, talk to us a little bit about the importance of, of uh, how you do data quality out in the Tenth Circuit. Well, first of all, we have uh, data quality reports. And those are listings of every docket entry that the case managers have made the day prior. And each case manager runs their data quality report every morning, and they have someone on their team check their work. And any errors that are made are just brought back to that person, and they, they because everyone has editor privileges, they have the access to editor, they can fix their own mistakes. Um, we find this to be very beneficial, and um, and that it started right away. As soon as a new case manager starts, they get a data, data quality report. Um, Amy, I understand that um, because you're uh, organized into teams, it's expected that uh, that uh, team members will share not only with their own teams but um, when they find an effective practice or something that they have discovered, uh, they're actually responsible for sharing with other teams as well uh, uh, how they go about it or what, or what they found. Isn't that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. And, you know, when somebody does find a better way of doing something, they'll usually bring it to the clerk. And if he agrees with it, then it'll go around the office. It'll be discussed, usually via email. And if we find that that is, in fact, a better way or a better procedure, um, if it's more efficient or whatever, um, we will take that procedure. It'll, it'll be put in place. Thank you so much. Well, the fax machine is working, and I'm happy to say that we've, uh, we've received a fax, and I'll read it to the folks here. Uh, while quality control is not a hot issue in our circuit, at least I think it isn't, we hear a lot about the changes that will come with CMECF especially that attorneys can electronically file and dock it. Will case managers have to focus more on data quality, and how do you think they'll be trained to do so? Which one of my brave panel members would like to, uh, to take that? I'll jump in and say I think it adds a whole new facet to, the, uh, to training and quality control. Uh, you have to review and make uh, corrections to actions taken by the bar in regard to their docket entries. Uh, you have to uh, train the bar in regard to proper docket entries. It uh, will add a whole new uh, aspect uh, at this point in time. We, of course, bring to counsel's attention if there's a deficiency in their pleadings in regard to the uh, a motion being filed or proper formatting of the brief, but this whole adds a whole new layer of review and, uh, and training the bar to make proper entries. And so it, uh, I think the CMECF is going to be a uh, bold new world for the appellate courts in regard to their interrelationship with the practicing bar. Yeah. Kathy, anything to add? Well, to I certainly agree. Uh, I would say also that, um, that in our court we have, uh, we sort of isolate the uh, quality assurance um, and separate it out. Our case managers actually uh, can do their own. They receive their own reports and of course they should be monitoring their own cases. Uh, but um, I think the way that Amy described uh, how it's done in the tenth sort of prepares case managers in a little better way to do some quality control if, in fact, they have to uh, look at what attorneys have docketed and whether they have done it right or wrong. Uh, so um, that they that might be a really good way to prepare case managers because we certainly won't be able to have um, 
you know, just a few people doing quality uh, control at that point, I don't think, when we're in EC, uh, CMECF. Especially since case managers have so much of the responsibility uh, 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 initially, so they'll have to look at, uh, at what has been docketed, in fact, to, uh, right. and they're, to they're make the sure experts. that they're the experts. They they'll know, you know, what's right and what's wrong. That's and true. if this docket entry is off. you heard people say, I'd rather do it myself than train somebody else <laughs> to do it. Now they're going to be dealing with the bar in regard to uh, proper docket entries and how to uh, uh, make sure that they, uh, the case is in a proper status. And you know everything will be docketed consistently by the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is done consistently <laughs> by the bar. <laughs> So it'll be a unique challenge. I think just in the other, as part, the same as in uh, in uh, other court court units, it is a challenge. It's a cultural change that uh, yeah. that exists when others will be doing the the docketing for you. And uh, I know there are a lot of ex other examples uh, in both bankruptcy and in uh, in district courts of how they've gone about the process of bringing the bar in and training uh, attorneys to how to use their 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 system. So it will be a unique. Uh, a new challenge for case managers and the circuit courts, I'm sure. Um, let's again open the line up to any uh, push to talk uh, of courts. We'd like to find out what uh, you do uh, relating to uh, uh, data quality. And uh, so if there are any, are any questions, if, uh, if you have, we'd uh, uh, like to open it up right now. And if you come on, please try and identify uh, your, your circuit as well. Anyone out there? page turning. Okay, let's move on then. Um, uh, we have uh, on push to talk uh, Beth Walton, capital case coordinator for the Fourth, uh, Fourth Circuit. Uh, Beth, obviously ensuring that you receive accurate information is, is extremely important. Tell us a little bit about this uh, from a data quality perspective. What challenges this presents to you and uh, others in the Fourth Circuit uh, to ensure that the information uh, you receive is both prompt and accurate. Bob, with regard to the uh, death penalty cases, um, I think we start with reviewing the district court papers that we receive. Um, my data quality issues are more concerned with the attorney filings. We first start with their uh, appellant's docketing statement and compare that information to what we've received from the district court to make sure we have all the attorneys and parties correct. Um, that the jurisdictional, there are no jurisdictional flaws in the appeal, uh, especially with wardens, because they're frequently named as respondents in state habeas petitions and change quite frequently. So we need to make sure we have the current warden in as the respondent appellee in the case. Um, also, with regard to motions and responses, they have to be reviewed and uh, make sure that they have complied with the federal rules of appellate procedure as well as our court's local rules and internal operating procedures um, as the briefs and appendices and the same thing applies to those. Um, make sure and the death penalty cases move on a little faster track than some of the other cases so you need to be familiar with the um, rules and the procedures especially those that pertain to death penalty cases so you can review the documents and get any insufficiencies corrected before they're submitted to the panel um, when you get to a situation where you're dealing with an actual execution um, the data quality becomes a little less important because the priority of getting the papers in from counsel and onto the judges in time to get a decision before the execution uh, time arrives is a little, takes a little more priority over um, the data quality issues. We pretty much, whatever the attorneys file at that stage, we take and, and put out before the court. Uh, sometimes the quality issues transfer over to the court to make sure once you do get a decision from the panel, it takes care of all the um, procedural things like closing the case and issuing the mandate forthwith and the things that are required before the parties can move on up to the Supreme Court. Thanks so much, Beth. Uh, I want to remind uh, Push to Talkers that um, if you do respond, please try and mute your television just uh, a little bit so we won't get, uh, get feedback. Um, certainly what, what Beth said, I mean, it all comes down to effective communication, and that's what we're going to focus on uh, right now. And uh, throughout the Rollins, reference was made to the uh, case managers and other court staff uh, being good communicators and sharing the importance of sharing information. Those are really the, some of the key skills. In this segment, uh, we're going to be talking about communication. And by that mean, 
uh, we need. How do you keep abreast of, uh, of the many changes that, are, that occur in the FRAP rules, local rules, and IOPs? making sure that attorneys and all court customers, uh, including pro se filers, are made aware of those changes. Um, how do you keep them aware? You notify them events and, of events and judgments, as well as communicating with each other and uh, other court units. This is not an easy task, needless to say. Scott, let's start with uh, you this time. There are so many things happening during this particular uh, phase in the life of a case. Uh, set the stage for us. What do you think are the the key communication links that, uh, that need to exist. Well, Bob, I've identified four links that are key to communication within the Court of Appeals. The first of those is the communication between a case manager and the parties or counsel. Early on in the case, uh, we identify who the case manager is. The case manager's names go out on the original docking materials. Whenever a party calls into the court with a question, uh, the, the information officer will quickly ask, do you have a case pending before this court, or is this question in regard to a particular case? And if that is the case, then the question is referred to that particular case manager. So there's a strong link between the parties and counsel and the case managers. They uh, recognize that there is a person who's specifically responsible for that case and is knowledgeable of the status of that case. The second key communication link is, is intra-staff communications, questions that are asked of supervisors, and the clerk, the chief deputy, and myself in regard to the proper processing of cases. These lines of communication, which are so important to the issue of consistency in regard to uh, the processing of cases before the Court of Appeals. The third is interstaff communication between our office, the clerk's office, and uh, the Office of Staff Counsel, and the mediation attorneys. Uh, so much goes back and forth between these offices uh, that the communication must exist and must be good for the uh, cases to uh, proceed as quickly as possible for, through our court. The final and probably most important final communication is between our office and those uh, members of the court who will be considering the substantive merits of the case. We need to keep them informed as to the status of the case, what procedures have applied to a particular case, and how our procedures may impact upon their decision. So that final communication is with the court itself. Um, Kathy, in, in, in your introduction, in our introduction to this segment, you noted that uh, case managers have to be good, uh, good communicators. In fact, that 45% of your cases are either pro se or, or um, prisoner pro se. Uh, that's quite a challenge. What would you add to what uh, Scott has said? Well, um, in the Third Circuit, of course, a lot of the responsibility for dealing with pro se litigants has been shifted to the legal division um, because of some, some reorganizational changes. Um, uh, recently, but still case managers uh, in the operations uh, department do get lots of calls from pro se litigants. Uh, and um, as Tanya said, uh, this requires a lot of patience because these folks are, um, they're not at attorneys and they are um, emotionally involved in their case. And so it's, uh, they're a little bit different to deal with than an attorney. Um, so you, you have to be patient, you have to listen, of course you don't have all day. So you have to, again, find a fine line um, to try to help them as best you can without, um, uh, you know, taking too long. Um, I found a, a, a good technique is um, I, pro se's usually like to tell you their story and, um, and why, you know, they're aggrieved and um, they like to go into great detail and they sort of are looking for some support from you <laughs> or anyone. Uh, for their position and um, I like to listen for a little bit and then explain to the person that you know these are very good points but you probably want to organize these thoughts on paper so that you can put them in your brief or if you know depending on what kind of a case it is or whatever papers they might be submitting to the court on jurisdiction or whatever uh, so that the person who's going to um, decide your case uh, we'll, we'll have a chance to hear it because no matter how persuasive you are with me, it's not going to help. Uh, and so I think you, you know, you'd be best served to, to organize your thoughts uh, as you're doing, but put them down on paper and make sure you communicate with the court that way so mm -hmm. that it'll get to the right person. Mm -hmm. And that way you can, you know, not, not be rude or discouraging and yet kind of cut them off a little bit. Um, the, uh, I mean, I, I think as far as uh, pro se litigants, the only other thing is um, 
trying not to give any legal advice, of course. They're constantly looking for what do I do next, and uh, we can point them to the rules. Um, we can suggest that they take a look at the rules. We can tell them in general what will happen next, um, you know, but we can't really be uh, offering any kind of advice uh, on what they should do. Um, they have to do what they feel is right, you know, and, and, uh, and that's what we can tell them. You know, we can, uh, we can tell you how long you might have to submit something or what you should be submitting uh, according to the deadlines. As, as stated in the rules. In right. Fact, but, uh, um, but that's basically what we're limited to. So as long as they understand um, your own limitations, the case manager's own limitations, they don't expect too much. Most of our case managers deal with uh, the pro se litigants, and it doesn't have to go any further. There are always the, uh, the pro se litigants who, who demand to be, you know, they want the supervisor or they want someone, someone else. And so sometimes the, the calls will have to be um, knocked up a, a level to, um, to one of the attorneys or they can send it to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, and then and then we'll deal with it. But I'd say for the most part, our case managers are very good about um, handling the calls uh, in the first instance. Thanks, uh, Amy. Again, in the tenth, how do you deal with uh, pro se litigants? Well, our case managers deal with pro se litigants. Um, they receive all the calls, and if they are um, difficult, then we they can be referred to our clerk or chief deputy. Um, but mostly, you know, the pro se's keep the job interesting. And um, we have a tool that we use that we find very effective um, for communicating within the office and with pro se's and attorneys, and that's what we call clerk's notes. And it's a basic docket entry that um, is put into a case, docketed internally into a case, so only, only uh, the, well, the, the public cannot see it. But it can explain what's going on in the case, anything unusual, et cetera, so that if somebody else goes to pull up the case, they can tell what's going on just by looking at the clerk's notes. So that's actually kind of a, like a bit of a case history, what discussions may have occurred relating to this case, uh, et cetera, kind of a... Uh, a yellow sticky, right? That's put right on the the internal docket. Exactly. Okay. Um, that type of that type of alerting others to information again reminds me of the effective practice that uh, that o o Oliva George from the Second Circuit uh, uh, noted to flag certain instances where uh, where things should move a little quicker or at least communicating, you know, internally. And I know that. Uh, in the Fourth Circuit, um, they've developed a method to um, to help keep uh, attorneys aware of some of the changes in the uh, in the FRAP rules, local rules, uh, and IOPs. And it's I think it's the the color green that um, that is put on 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 various notifications. That's Scott. Right. Well, the Fourth Circuit, like uh, all the appellate courts, we send counsel a lot of paper, and we're not sure that it's all being read. And so it, uh, to ensure or at least increase the possibility of being able to communicate changes to counsel, we will color code them and uh, with the hope that, that that green sheet saying important attention will be, uh, will be read with care so that uh, counsel will be aware of uh, significant changes in our practices and procedures. That, uh, and it's worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, if you have a colored sheet in there among the, uh, the rest of the white packet, they tend to focus on that, particularly if you put some type of banner across the top indicating this is important. Please do not proceed without reading this first. <laughs> they might listen. Yes, that's right. <laughs> it is, uh, it's a, a very important. And of course, we, we're careful within the clerk's office as well to color code certain documents that uh, we find are important for us to take note of. It's, it's easy to look through a case file and, and see a, a jurisdictional sheet, which is orange, yeah. uh, and other sheets, which are uh, a, a briefing sheet in regard to sufficiency, which is blue, and we can see that very quickly so that uh, uh, the issues that may come up in regard to these particular points are addressed as opposed to being lost in the shuffle. Um, let's go from paper to the use of technology. Uh, increasingly so, courts are using their websites to communicate with their customers. And uh, on a website, you'll find the local rules. You'll find directions how to get to the courthouse. Uh, everything that, uh, that are the, good, uh, the hallmarks of good, uh, good customer service. So um, 
to prepare for this particular broadcast, we uh, took a look at some of the, uh, of the court websites and how they communicate to the public. And we noticed that uh, uh, the Fifth Circuit um, uh, has an electronic notification of events system uh, on its website. And we've asked uh, Ken Russo from the Fifth Circuit to tell us a little bit about why this was done and, uh, and uh, the reception on the part of, uh, of customers. Uh, Ken, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Thanks. Great. Yes, the reason we did this is we had read about the features available in CMECF for the bankruptcy and district court, and frankly, we were pretty jealous, especially considering the fact that appellate CMECF was and still is a few years down the road. So what we decided to do is implement one of the... Um, easier to steal features of CMECF, and that was electronic notifications of events. Put, put simply, the system, once a day, goes through all the docket entries that were made during the course of the business day, and when it finds matches of attorneys who have registered for the system, along with docket entries that we wish to notify them on, it compiles them and it sends out a mass mailing every night to every attorney who's registered for the system and has had a docket entry in their case that meets the criteria. We only send out notifications on briefing notices, files and rules on motions to extend the time to file a brief or to suspend briefing times, file briefs, and file an act on a petition for rehearing. We plan on extending that to automatically sending out the, um, the opinion, but we already have a different mechanism for that right now. We have an opinion subscription service that we've had for some years, so we haven't tackled that one yet. What the attorney gets is basically the docket entry. We just take the same snippet of text that would come from the docket entry and we email them that. Uh, the, the hope is that the attorney will appreciate getting an active notification on us that something has happened in the case, spare them from having to, you know, go to PacerNet and refresh, you know, the last 10 entries type of lookup constantly to find out if something's happened, and would cut down on phone calls to us. I'm not sure how well it's done on cutting down phone calls, but we have over 3,000 attorneys who are registered uh, for the system now. I'd say if you cut down on just a few phone calls, you've... Uh and you've given them the information that they've needed, that's, that's, that in fact is, is significant. We know that in some of the circuits, um, uh, 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 judgments or other things will be posted, but not the notification of all the events. So we think that's, uh, that's pretty significant. Uh, we just have about five more minutes for this broadcast, and I want to offer the opportunity one more time for, uh, for uh, push to talk courts to uh, ask a question or perhaps uh, uh, tell us how uh, this how things are done in in their circuit. Thank you, Bob. This is Barbara Schumerhorn from the Tenth Circuit BAP. Hi, Barbara. And I, I have a question for Kathy. And I have a question for Kathy. Can you tell me more, or can you give me more information on verbal motions? Uh, hi, Barbara. Yeah, we have a, a local rule that was instituted recently that allows for a, attorneys to request a, an up to two week extension of time uh, over the telephone. And that limit has, um, I think, uh, discouraged some attorneys because they really like to ask for 30 days usually. Uh, but it certainly has been used and uh, when that comes in, we will uh, bring it to the attention of the uh, legal coordinators uh, of rather the uh, legal assistants, and um, we will, um, you know, they will they'll act on it right away. There is some paper involved. Kelly mentioned this in in one of the er in earlier opening uh, blurbs uh, that um, it's kind of cut down on paper. There is some paper involved, but it it's really to help the lawyer who's kind of cr pressed for time, obviously, and that's why they're asking for an extension so they don't have to go through the. Uh, the whole formality of uh, doing a, a, a formal motion. Uh, they do have to send something co confirming in writing, though, that the uh, extension has been uh, granted, so that w there is some some kind of uh, written confirmation. That's basically how it works. I don't know that I, I you know I guess is Kelly out there in the Third Circuit? Maybe she'd like to let us know. She might have a feel for how many times that's been used. Yes, I'm here. 
Kelly, do you, do you want a, a comment on um, how many times this is used? Is it? Let me note also, we only have about three minutes, so it has to be a, just a short response, Kelly. Just to help Thanks. Barbara out. Um, it does happen quite frequently. Um, I would say for today, for example, I've already received three phone calls requesting okay. extensions, and that's probably about an average number. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Barb, for, for calling in. Um, let's close this session um, uh, now, but um, I want to thank everybody so much for participating. Uh, today we've taken a look at appellate case processing, not only from uh, the perspective of how it's implemented uh, in, in the circuits, uh, but also from the point of what challenges court staff face and the practices uh, they use to, to meet those challenges. And, uh, uh, we here at the center and all of our panel members hope you found this broadcast to uh, be both informative and directly related to what you do uh, on the job. I want to again thank our panelists for joining me today, Kathy Brower, Scott Ritchie, uh, Amy Frazier, and also Susan, uh, Susan Gelmas. Um, I want to uh, also thank our planning committee, and you're going to see their names on, on the credits. They were extremely helpful uh, in, in helping uh, really us determine the kinds of topics we ought to be covered. Um, uh, a special thanks to Kay Usual and, and for all the logistical work she did in setting up the program, and to Mary Ann Luckett for transcribing all our interviews uh, and the conference calls. Uh, to Marcy Waldron, thank you so much for allowing us to come to the Fourth Circuit and interview the splendid staff, Third Circuit, sorry, to inter uh, interview the splendid staff uh, that, you, that you have there. Uh, I want to leave you with a quote from Justice Souter that I think says it all. Whatever court we're in, whatever we're doing, at the end of our task, some human being is going to be affected. Some human life is going to be changed in some way by what we do. We had better use every power of our minds and our hearts and our beings to get these rulings right. The appellate court staff plays such an important role in, in keeping cases moving and on track. Uh, we all should be proud, I think, of, of the work that you do. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you on our next FJTN broadcast on Appellate Cases. <laughs>